All right. right. Recording is started. So for those who haven't read it, uh, the, the task that the three of us took on the, in the last couple of weeks and really kind of the last few hours um, was to come up with super cheap Drupal hosting. Um, not necessarily responsible hosting for grown-ups, but uh, effective hosting for Drupal 8 at the lowest price point we could find. Uh, so each of us took a slightly different approach and came up with something, and then we're all going to talk about it quickly, uh, that make sure we know that it works, talk about why it might not necessarily be a great idea, uh, and how much it would cost to actually implement. Does that sound like what you guys are prepared for? Yep. Then, Chris, you want to take it away? I can. Uh, as soon as I find uh, the sharing button. Oh, if you lean forward just right, you block the sun and we can see you. <laughs> no, I can, uh, I can fix that. <laughs> Sorry, it's the one room that has giant windows. I enjoy uh, my sunshine during the day. Share. Uh, da, da, da. The In green. Yes. Uh, can you see, a, hopefully, a browser tab with AWS plastered across the yep. front? Cool. OK. so. Uh, I went with AWS, which was convenient because that's kind of been uh, my bread and butter for my main project for the last few months. Um, I, will, uh, I originally got a little over ambitious with my approach, um, but we'll talk about where I settled on and where if I had more time, um, well, not if I had more time, if I spent more time, I think I could go. So, um, Went with AWS, uh, Drupal, especially Drupal 8, doesn't need a very large tier. Um, was able to put it on um, an EC2 instance, their T2 micro. I guess first uh, I should explain uh, in case uh, or not, but AWS's uh, EC2 instances, you can think of more or less as your typical managed web server. It's about the closest comparison that you can have. Um, you can spin those up based off of images, and they operate lar largely like um, any hosted uh, virtual managed hosting provider I I've ever interacted with. Um, so this is a, the T2 micro is eligible for the free tier on the account, which I think resets every year, but basically it uh, will give me some free runway of um, hosting, I think up to 750 hours. So it's free for now um, as far as the actual uh, web and PHP engine. Uh, the T2 micro, which is very tiny, gives me a whopping one gig of memory, uh, two virtual CPUs. Uh, when my free tier expires, it should average out to roughly $8 a month. Um, so I took a bit, uh, ended up going a little bit different tack. I wanted to go with MySQL originally, needed some kind of database storage engine. Um, and thought this would be a fun opportunity to play with Aurora Serverless. Um, uh, uh, sorry, AWS is Aurora RDS uh, Serverless. RDS is, oh, I forget what it stands for because AWS has a million acronyms, but it's a fairly robust managed uh, storage, uh, database storage solution, um, and is more or less a drop in replacement for MySQL. Um, RDS has the advantages of it's already tuned, highly tuned for performance, so you don't need to go in and dial in the 8 million NODB or my ISAM settings, which is nice. Um, kind of eliminates the cost of us having to do that. And it's super resilient and very, very quick when it comes to like taking snapshots or restoring it. Um, even has, and they're all optional, it has like uh, what I think of as a git log, a commit log for um, reads and write or writes to the database. Um, and I like the idea of like, yes, it's irresponsible hosting, um, but I like the idea of like, if I wanted to, I can put an elastic load balancer in front of this to allow for that kind of horizontal growth. At the moment, I'm only running a single instance and a single RDS instance. Uh, so uh, benefits of RDS serverless, um, it's effectively, like I said, it's effectively MySQL. 
Uh, it's already tuned, so we don't have to spend any time uh, tuning that in or getting it to tweaking the settings for performance. Um, the serverless is a, is a neat advantage of it's much like um, some of the other AWS and other cloud provider serverless technologies. It will go to sleep when you stop using it. Um, and while it's asleep and not active, it's not, you're not paying for anything. It's, it's a free service waiting to be called upon and restored. Um, upon testing, uh, the restoring time for going to a cold state to an active state was roughly between 30 and 45 seconds, which I deemed acceptable for my little itty bitty baby food store or a rest I, it's a recipe site. Um, but it still gives me like the hyper resilience of um, RDS, which means I've got a reader and writer. Again, it's taking regular interval snapshots. If I want, I can enable the additional um, commit log where I can go back through and replay writes to the database um, if there's ever a major catastrophe. And of course, with all um, hosted database solutions, I can restore a snapshot from any previous point in time. Um, and big, uh, big win on the cost here. Uh, again, we're shooting for dollar cost, but also I like the, I don't have to worry about it. All of this is just done for me. I tell ADS, I would like this, please. I hit the button and it's done. I don't ever have to think about it again. Uh, downsides of serverless. Of course, this is uh, waiting up to a minute for the database server to wake back up from a cold state is not ideal in almost every application I've worked for and worked with in the past. Uh, so there are some uh, downsides that come with that. Um, all in all, it uh, I could have given up the RDS and gone with like a server their equivalent like MySQL serverless um, and averaged in a fairly resil resilient hosting package for about twenty dollars a month minus uh, you know subtracting my free tier hosting off of the EC2. Um, but RDS is slightly more expensive because you get that resiliency and the tuning. And uh, I, I went with it because I don't have to worry about managing it at all. Um, from an infrastructure, because I was too lazy and didn't have the time, uh, this is largely what I, I'm doing with my infrastructure. This is apparently something Redmine did at some point in the, um, in the past. Uh, but I would have a load balancer sitting in front of an EC2 instance. I only have one. But being EC2 at any point in time, I can enable auto scaling. So I can add multiple instances to the same load balancer and the load balancer will um, very easily navigate traffic between the two depending on uh, EC2 instance load and also can do things like detect server the EC2 instance server state and if it's getting unhealthy, spin up more to try to help deal with the load. Um, with it being serverless, again, it's going to remain asleep until something tries to request, make a request to read or write from it, at which point it will go from its sleep state to its awake state. Uh, and yes, it's it's really real. It's out there. I didn't even bother setting up the uh, uh, But this is uh, my uh, server running on a little itty bitty baby micro T2 instance, which truthfully, and just testing around and poking around, um, I may be a little overzealous to throw too much resources at a project. Um, I think this is honestly reasonably quick for how tiny the instance was. I've never run anything on, a, on the T2 micros um, for fear of how tiny they are. Um, so that's all. I think where I did mention I had a grandiose idea. Um, what I would like to do, and I'm going to continue to explore and we'll definitely share with the group. Um, I, I like the idea of the serverless RDS. I definitely like having on-demand um, database server that can go to sleep. I don't pay for it while it's not being used. I wanted to put Drupal in uh, a Lambda, which is AWS's serverless um, function calls, basically where on-demand it can, a uh, Lambda instance would spin up. And again, there's that cost of waiting for it to but in looking at how many calls get made to Drupal in the application, it would not be performant or cost effective to wrap the entirety of Drupal within. So what I was looking at doing is potentially um, wrapping Gatsby um, in front of Drupal. So anytime you wanted to interact with the content management portion of Drupal, um, or even have some kind of Drupal uh, REST endpoint, so, Drupal could still be responsible for doing things like generating views. 
we could spin up a Lambda instance, call it to the PHP application, and either return back some kind of like uh, hard cache or spin up the RDS instance and return back um, uh, whatever the dynamic results we had to create an endpoint for. But with that instance, we would have we could have like entirely static um, HTML files for our site that are perfectly fine ninety percent of the time. At which point, we could just have uh, the T2 version of like an S3 bucket, which is basically free. At which point, it's just finding somewhere to stash your HTML files and potentially throwing like CloudFront in front of that. Um, I was not able to spin up the Gatsby thing as quick as I had hoped. But I kind of like that. Like, if if it's at all feasible, I think like that could actually be a semi-responsible hosting infrastructure at an extremely low cost, assuming people aren't editing content and you don't actually need Drupal, but once in a while, which I think is the case for a lot of the sites we do, people will get in and, and maybe edit content a couple times a month, and for the rest part, it just sits there managing content and spinning out, it uh, sits there spitting out template files for the majority of its life cycle. Cool. Who wants to go next? I'll go. You ready, Will? Yeah, well, let's do this. That was good, Chris. Thanks for sharing. It's a really, really cool stuff. I don't think it'll look more into AWS soon, but yeah, I, I definitely went an entirely different route with uh, my cheap presentation. Um, so let me see, let me get this over to another screen. Present and share. Let me get back to the first slide, hold on. Okay. Okay, can everybody see the screen? Yep. Okay. On yep. So my cheap route was uh, going, I guess, more towards the irresponsible route. And um, one of the things here is I'm using a Raspberry Pi. And um, so looking at the hardware breakdown of what I've got here, um, Raspberry Pi Zero. So that's $5. Uh, it's just a small little thing that you can get from um, Micro Center, Amazon, a um, few places on the internet, but it's uh, five bucks. And um, then you also need a micro SD card, uh, pretty much anything works. Um, class 10, but you can get these really cheap off Amazon too, 5.79, so total of $10.79. Um, but that's just the hard, the one-time cost if you don't already have it. Uh, so once you have it, like in my case, I kind of already had this laying around, uh, trying to break it down like as far as monthly and yearly cost. So this is, um, really, really low cost comparison. And I had to do some research into roughly how much power does a Raspberry Pi Zero consume. Um, there is some math I'm sparing you from, but basically it comes down to like, I think it was, um, the, yeah, I think it's, it's 0.5, is it five thousandths or 50 thousandths of a kilowatt, um, which we're running at for 24 hours a day, which comes down to, or in at, uh, 0.79 cents or 0.79 cents what it is uh, here for where I live. Uh, that comes down to um, month uh, 0.0002 cents a month uh, cost per year is still less than a penny, um, 0, 0 0.3. Um, but very, very low cost per year once you have this set up. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, I actually do have this set up for us too. So it's, it's also real. Um, and but first off, I actually yeah. have to show it to, show it to you here. You can't access the URL quite yet. Uh, so this is a small demo I've got here. Um, I do have this plugged in charging. So let me unplug this. And that should yeah, you can see it's booting up. Are we going VR on this one? But yeah, so it's booting up here, and it's it's really small. Um, we can only see the slide, Will. Oh right. Uh -oh. I'm, stop the share so so yeah this is um, pretty small wow. so I mean it's it's currently booting up and uh, so this is a little bit different than one of the parts here so I've got the, the Pi Zero on the SD card but I also have a battery attached to the back of this thing um, so power it's it's completely wireless uh, I've just got it on a little stand here to kind of hold it up um, but that's completely wireless. And let me see if that is up. Yeah, it takes a minute to boot, but once it boots, 
I'm going to go back to my screen share. Okay, so let me go back to my screen share here. All right, so this is uh, this is a pretty bare bone. I started to go with Unami. Um, I figured I'd give the little Raspberry Pi Zero a break, though. <laughs> Keep it pretty basic. Um, but I guess to to check all of the boxes of the challenge, uh, I'll go into the stash port, look at the version of PHP, and make sure it's the most recent version. Which also we can show. Do have an error? That's just with the trusted host settings, so I'm going to kind of ignore that. Um, but version of PHP 7.2. Um, this is running Raspbian, which I think is yeah down here Apache 2.4 on Raspbian, and it's completely wireless. So this site is hosting on a production URL um, here. So I guess the point with this was that you could put this anywhere. I mean, you could. I mean, I don't know where you, why you would want to do that, um, but you could if you wanted to. Um, you could, I, I think Aaron and I were talking about potentially stashing this somewhere in like a, a particular place has open Wi-Fi uh, that doesn't violate terms of service. And so that was an important piece in that. But, um, but yeah, so uh, you could have put this there and I guess technically get free hosting, you know, depending on how the power bill situation is, but um, that's the thing. And I guess you had access to the router to do port forwarding and stuff too. But yeah, so that's for the most part it. Um, let's see, I think I've uh, got a few more resources here. So uh, Jeff Gearling has done a whole lot of work into this and actually more, um, a much deeper dive. And this is kind of where I got some of the information regarding the, the power consumption, but um, he's done a few posts about uh, conserving energy, how to turn off the LED and how to do some uh, more advanced stuff to really stretch it out and to get the most out of a battery or, um, I guess lose or to use as many or as less least amount of power as possible, um, which I guess all goes back into you know how much it costs per month. Um, so it's not quite free. Uh, so there probably are some free options out there, but um, this was this is a fun one. So just throw it together, but and that's pretty much it. So but. thanks, Aaron. It's over to you. <laughs> uh, I, I love the power calculations, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> How do I mail my power company three hundredth of a penny? <laughs> Direct okay, draft. Well, <laughs> Raspberry Pi hosting will be what makes Bitcoin mainstream finally. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and. So I did not put together a PowerPoint presentation. I wrote a blog post last night. So this blog post will be up uh, in a couple hours because I said it's automatically publish itself, so I didn't have to remember. Um, but the solution I did is getting this Unami site up on Netlify uh, using the Drupal Tome distribution, which provides a static site generator for Drupal. Uh, so you can run it, and then I did this using Doxel in my local environment. Uh, so I have a local instance on my laptop of, uh, of Drupal running in a Doxel environment on top of Docker, and then commit the uh, content up to GitHub, and then it automatically deploys from GitHub to Netlify. And the content is HTML? Uh, so Tome writes the content out as JSON, uh, so it, and then every time Netlify builds, it's actually fully installing Drupal from scratch, importing the JSON, generating the HTML, and deploying the HTML. It's a tad bit slow. <laughs> uh, it, it's not the fastest solution. Uh, in terms of the build process. On the other hand, it's a fully static site that uh, is relatively snappy because it's all rendered HTML markup. There's no, you know, it's all, even all of the various taxonomy pages and whatnot are uh, static. The only thing that doesn't, the problems I did not solve with it are the 
uh, handling of uh, forms, and there is some there are there's some support for that out there, both for the uh, contact forms and for search, uh, or you can set up one of the JavaScript-based search engines would be the other way to go, but I did not do that. I just got the basic static site up and running. Um, and there are pretty good directions actually from the Tome project on how to do the Netlify part. The problem I had was that they had really good Docker instructions and they have really good Tome or really good Netlify instructions, but they don't line up. So you get through to the Docker instructions and you have a nice local working instance but there's nothing about how to get it to do the build out to Netlify embedded in that. So I started from the other side um, and within the documentation, there is just a deployed Netlify uh, button, which will allow you to create an account and spin up the Netlify instance uh, and build out there. Uh, and that all that really does is provide you the build script which I had down here somewhere. There's, if that's the build script it creates, this, uh, but the composer install, Drush Tome install, and Drush Tome static uh, with the parameter URL. So it's a good thing going to rewrite all the URLs to have the right domain on it. So if you're using Netlify with its branching setup, every time it builds, it builds with the right URL where it needs it. For the Doxel piece, so I'd done all this work on it. I did all, everything in Docker, and then I got installed. And so I did it again from the Netlify direction and went through all their instructions for how to set it up in Netlify, uh, which is basically click the turquoise button. Sure, we'll call it turquoise. Um, that will you know, ask you to log into GitHub with their uh, API user, and it will then spin up the repo at GitHub. So I meant to actually pull this up. I'll go find my GitHub repo here while I keep talking. Um, it creates the repo at GitHub for you, uh, clone that down to my local environment. Uh, so there's the, the repo it created, which also includes the Netlify button. Uh, that's just a generated readme. I haven't rewritten it yet. Uh, and then from the project root, I told Doxel to set itself up. And so I had Doxel do the sim and hit composer install and tome install. So the pieces of the thing that the right thing set of instructions that uh, Netlify is running, I ran most of them locally. Uh, I went ahead and ran Drush UI, so I would have the login URL. But from there, you can log in on your local Doxel, make changes. Uh, and push all that back out to, uh, or to, and then you can run Tom Static and commit the changes. Tom Static builds it? That is what builds the, the JSON. Uh, and like this. And then you wait. Because Doxel is, or no, Netlify is, has to both do the pull to bring over the content, but then it's doing the full uh, composer install and Drush Tome install. Uh, not neither of which is particularly fast. When I did it just following the Netlify instructions, it installs, uh, uh, from Tone's Netlify instructions, it just installs Drupal Basic, or Drupal Standard uh, profile. And I decided to want to make sure that I could do something more interesting, so went for Unami, uh, which meant in my local, I reran the Drush, the Tome init command, which will then nuke whatever you have locally and ask you what profile you want to install. And so I went ahead and installed Unami. Uh, and then I just re-exported, but I could, you could make content changes uh, and away you go. So does it store content as JSON instead of uh, SQL? Yes. One of the things I noticed, and, and it's in the write-up here, um, it, when it uh, did all of the build, the Tome instance, even though I have Doxel running in the default, which means I have MySQL available, Tome went right to SQLite 
and it ran it all on a local SQLite database instead of running it on MySQL. So it, in my local, it's a little bit hooky. Um, if I switch over here to my local, so this is where I've got that local, and this is already, this is where I did the fin in it and install, so everything is here. Um, but if you compare it to the repo out at GitHub, you'll see like, there's no web directory out here. Uh, in particular, vendor is not here. So this is, I'm not sharing this on the big screen. Sorry, guys. How are you pushing media across? Like, is it base 64 encoding the images or it, does Unami uh, grab those from some web accessible location? I don't know where Unami gets them from, honestly, unless you know where you installed Unami, where it got them from. Um, but when I do the Tome, Tome static, public files gets a collection of JPEGs. Okay. Oh, and then that so you push all If of you were running this as an actual local, like if you're running this, and I'll actually read, I haven't started the server back up, but let me, all right. We'll go ahead and be brave and show the entire desktop for a minute so you guys see when I'm hopping around. Um, so if I start it up, um, it'll take just a second here. But yeah, it's now exporting all of the assets as as files. So either it's the the JSON files for the content, and then all the JPEGs into the files directory, and the CSS uh, and JS files get uh, distributed appropriately. Interesting. How did, so is Tome crawling all of Drupal's registered routes, or is it like crawling all links it finds on the page? Um, I believe it crawls all the routes. OK. Um, I haven't read through all of its documentation. And, I, and like I said, I haven't really explored dealing with the search or you know, getting rid of login. Um, although certainly you can get rid, of, get rid of it the same way you normally would get rid of login. Um, but getting rid of the login link, uh, so it was you know, it's out of your way. Uh, and I also never reset the password, so I don't even know what the password is on that local instance. Uh, but Drust UI will get it for us here in a second. There we go. Grab that. So again, this is the copy in my local. Um, did I actually hit in? Here it goes. And it did for some reason pick 8.6, uh, not 8.7. Uh, I think that just has to do with whatever's in the composer file kicking around from Tome. But it should just, you know, you could just do a composer update. I just didn't do that. And obviously, yeah, this is you know this is Unami, so I haven't added any of the other modules that might be more somewhat universal in terms of improving the admin menus and whatnot. But right, so we can just go in. Save it. Rush tone stack. And so this will now regenerate from tone the content. Um, for I guess the 52 HTML pages that, that Unami has. Um, and what it's outputting here is the JSON, and I'll do a diff to the repo in just a second so you can see where that came in once we have the new content. Um, so the upside on this in terms of cost is that it was just the cost of the domain, which since I used subdomain on my personal domain was nothing. Um, if you wanted the extra Netlify you know, features within their pricing tier, that's where you're gonna hit costs first. Be, you know, if you want and Netlify analytics, um, the extra concurrent users, the other 
features that Netlify asks for money for, you would need that. Uh, same with GitHub, right? This is a public repo. Um, you can make it private now. I, that one uh, Netlify can't, the remote applications can't always link to free stuff. So Netlify only hooks up to public repos if you're on free tiers at both ends. So it's mostly date changes. There is the new content. Um, and that's it. I mean, it, so it hasn't, let's just do it. And in theory, well, I don't know exactly how long it's going to take. So in some number of minutes that I haven't actually stopped to measure, this will now be out on that public site with that extra little comment down there at the bottom. Uh, and Netlify's interface will tell you uh, Netlify. Net I always get those two bits though. Oops, that was the instruction. <laughs> yeah, this is the first time I've used Netlify for anything. It's been Kind of fun to see what what was involved. Um, I'm using it to uh, host my neglected website. <laughs> and so yeah, it's still has the last update from two days ago. It hasn't quite pulled through the. Oh, it's still building. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So again, it it, uh, it does take a couple of minutes to to pull that content through. Again, it is doing a full Drupal install. Um, and I think that's some of why it's why Tome wants to be on SQLite is it's an easier assumption that wherever you are, it's more likely to have SQLite than MySQL. Um, it's some of why Core picked up support for it. Flow is SQLite often is. Uh, nope, But that's about all there is to it. The you know, Netlify had a couple extra steps I had to do to get it to set up uh, Let's Encrypt so that it was secure. Or is secure. It, you'll see the lock is there. I am running it secure. Um, oh, there we go. Starting triple inflation. This takes a while. Yes. Truth in advertising. It does indeed take a while. If, if someone wanted to uh, update the site, they would have to check out the project and run it locally. Right. So for, if, if you had multiple editors of a site, this would be a fairly lousy instant setup. I mean, certainly Tome is kind of designed with the theory of like you use it on the server. And so all your editors, it's kind of a similar to the use case Chris was talking about before. If you have a Drupal sitting around someplace, that's accessible to a small number of people, and then it publishes out to Netlify. Because if you're running a brochure site, it doesn't, you know, the content's not changing that often. You're not leveraging the full dynamic nature of Drupal. So you don't need all that stuff. Um, the, you know, just generating the content will get you home. For, yeah, if you have lots of concurrent editors, that's going to start to get super slow, super fast. Uh, if you have a lot of content change, a lot of editors, but if you have one, you know, if you're a one person operation or, you know, if, and you don't want to have every copy of every website on your local machine, you know, I, I could just check out the repo again. I can nuke this entire thing locally, check out the repo again in three weeks and, you know, fin init or, you know, fin start, there it is, home install, I'm ready to go and make my content changes, export, push, nuke it all again, and I'm done. Ah. I haven't seen that before. We'll see if we actually care. <laughs> so is, is there like a cap on GitHub? Like say the site's getting too big with like a bunch of uploaded images? Uh, anybody remember off the top of their head the free limits on GitHub? I mean, you'll hit individual files. 
I was I thought either a hundred or five hundred gig though of megabytes. Right. A mega, oh, per file, yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a few hundred megs of file. So in video would be bad. So um, let's say they were like images could get bad right. if you did too much. Yeah. Uh, if you have a database of the entire state salary with all of the history since it started getting publicly published, you come up to that limit but don't cross it. I happen to know, um, <laughs> uh, but that. Uh, so yeah, I mean, you'll, you could hit limits there. Netlify has limits as well for its free tier. Um, oops, site is live. There it is. Uh, I don't remember which tab it is. Oh, first of all. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is why you don't do demos in front of people. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that dressure was. It worked perfectly the other night when I was making changes. Uh, not sure what was wrong. I I grew a little suspect when you pushed up less pages than you had a minute ago. Uh, oh, did, did, did that end up? Yeah. So I don't know what was wrong with the actual demo, but that's why you don't do live demos with that. Testing them ahead of time, but it really did work up till then. Uh, and I really said I wrote up the what I did the other day and. The place I knew, I know you would have issues uh, over time is making sure you've got concurrent editors handled and the forms. And there is support, like Netlify provides form support. Uh, so you can do it that way. I just didn't take the time to, to sort out how we would put a contact form in. And there is a Tom Netlify module that says it supports that, uh, but I didn't quite figure out how to wire that in. I installed it and it asked me for some, IP, some uh, keys, but I couldn't quite figure out how it took over and handled that particular part of the job. But when you say think that this form, is, is that like uh, like how HubSpot will host forms, or is it actually wanting to call back to its uh, like host Drupal site? Uh, Netlify has some kind of solution for they help host the form and capture the data. And then they handle all the captcha, spam, protection, garbage. Um, so it would not come into Drupal, it would come out uh, the it would come out the other side. Uh, but again, you would be able to have a basic contact form on the website. So again, your brochure where it needs one contact form. Uh, is no big deal. That's, that's pretty slick with the next slide. I like that. Any questions? <laughs> Laptop back and turn the camera back on. People can actually see it. Yep, that's the one. The VR machine. How'd you how'd you get the oops? I was gonna share that. How'd you get that publicly on the internet? You know all that? Oh, uh well, actually you well, you probably have to <laughs> What's that? You you probably pay for the tier of internet where they won't block port eighty or change your IP, don't you? Oh yeah, you know I would riot. <laughs> I would riot. Um, no, 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 no. The only reason why it's not port eighty and and it's port eighty eighty is because that's I have other services running on port eighty. So mostly I. It was one challenge I ran into trying to host from home hardware in the past, but that was more me taking a liberty with how often Comcast really changed my IP. Yeah, my, my local ISP um, 
line of broadband they don't uh so they, they don't they don't offer static ip like that's something that they only reserve for business um customers but what they don't tell you is they don't actually update them either so i mean like I, i've I've literally had the same IP address for like six years and it even follows me too. So like it's with my modem. So like it's, I haven't had to update DNS in a very long time. So. Fascinating. Moved locations and everything. Yeah. So. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. It's uh, just, it's this battery power that would probably last for, I don't know, a few hours, I would think. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording, and then I'm going to want something else for the record.